Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our office at Warsaw M Tumisha Street. I'd also like to welcome the viewers who are watching our streaming online. We're convening to discuss the operating and financial results for, uh, of PG Group for 2018. The hosts of today's meeting will be uh, Mr. Richard Pashilevich, uh, operating uh, COO, and uh, Emil um, Vashilevich, uh, CFO. Uh, my name is Kuba uh, Vashilevich. I'm the investor relationships manager. Traditionally, we'll start with the presentations, then we'll have the uh, Q&A &A session uh, from the room. And since we have viewers online, we have a possibility of asking questions online, and then we relate to them. Without further ado, over to you, uh, Mr. President. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to say a couple of words about and show you a couple of slides on the operating results. Nonetheless, on the first slide, which you can see there, uh, there are our financial results, and I will only focus on this and comment on them that they are splendid, whereas the results will be discussed by Mr. Wojtovic and uh, CFO, and I will tell you more about those operating issues. That's the element on the right-hand side. Everywhere, in brackets, you have, in parentheses, you have everything in green. So uh, every way you look at this, uh, the last year was better than the previous year. Of course, in many aspects, um, other than what I'll be talking about, this is also testified by the fact that throughout 2018, we already had EDF assets, which, as we know, um, have been working on all those results. And this is a very visible change, especially in the part connected with the um, cells of heat. As you can see, it's almost 50, um, uh, 50 uh, petajoules. Uh, and 100% growth, this was mostly triggered by the increase in the uh, district heating assets from, uh, from ED, um, EDF. Uh, and these figures show that whereas uh, we've been leaders in power generation after 20 17, 18, and the takeover of uh, EDF, we have also uh, consolidated our position in district heating, and we've become producers of, he of heat energy as well, and almost 50 million gigajoules shows that we are leaders in the generation of heat, and this was triggered by EDF assets. Among those assets, because these are also large uh, uh, co-generation plants, uh, Gdansk, uh, Torun, Zielona um, Góra, uh, Wrocław, where uh, our uh, co-generation plants uh, are working. The next slide shows how we've been showing how we're planning to change and how we changed in 2018, and particularly this is a slide which shows how we are going to change in the next years. On the one axis, you have uh, uh, our emission ratios which will be changing how the group the the energy and power generation leader will be changing in one of those most important assets given the EU regulations how the group is going to transform on the other hand we show why it's going to be changing so the upper axis and uh, those elements connected there show which new important launches will be carried out by us. Opole, Turuf, I will discuss it in greater detail about, uh, about this, uh, but this is a slide showing these 180 megawatts in Opole, uh, uh, one, uh, 1800 megawatts in Opole, uh, and uh, almost 500 megawatts in Turuf. At the same time, wind farms, that's a new uh, farm, or we uh, won the action last year, that's the cluster. Uh, farm in the western Pomeranian province about 100 megawatts photovoltaics 100 megawatts but I'd like to inform you that in the next time we are uh, planning to revise this program and we will be establishing a project team which will definitely uh, 
We will have much more ambitious inspirations in terms of photovoltaics than 100 megawatts. We definitely want to exploit our greater potential stemming from what we have in the distribution in the distribution part uh, at each GPZ. We will be trying to uh, take advantage of this the distribution that we have, the huge areas we have in place to be able to install much more than 100 megawatts in, uh, in uh, photovoltaics. Czechnica is a new CHPP unit in Wroclaw, uh, and that's where uh, a cogeneration uh, coal and partially biomass uh, uh, plant is, w is working. We will be converting into a gas-fired unit. I'd like to tell you that this is not only a change uh, like this, this is the largest project in the next um, years as, as, as far as the gas-fired unit is concerned, but right now we are uh, pursuing uh, smaller ones in Ruz, uh, in Lublin, Kielce, Gozhov, in Gozhov, by the way, we, we've just uh, commissioned a new unit, so also in these uh, locations new gas-fired elements will be appearing. I believe that in the, the upcoming strategy that we're working on, we will be showing you much deeper uh, changes in uh, cogeneration plants about the conversion uh, uh, in the uh, of our coal-fired into gas-fired assets because most often those power plants are located in city centers and we want to contribute to the lowering uh, of emissions. This is one of the elements. The next element is what we have in, in our uh, district heating strategy. As you will remember, there is an element about, about the assumption of, um, of district heating. We want for system heat to reach a greater number of apartments, and we want to do it in an active way by uh, taking over district heating networks. And through the synergies we've been observing in uh, uh, Torin and Gozhov, and Gozhov, as you will know we can support a very uh, good program Kafka that's about reaching uh, uh, our district heating uh, district the apartments with our district heating and this is our contribution in lowering uh, the low emissions that we w wish to obtain uh, Dolna Odra I will tell you more about this the offshore wind farm uh, I will tell you more about it later on Rybnik that's a new thing which has just appeared other than the two gas-fired units in Dolna Odra uh, power plant. We're planning on a similar unit, a similar clash unit. We want for uh, to, to have three um, units of the same class by the same manufacturer for the synergies connected with having three uh, same class units by the same manufacturer. So that's a matter of the spare parts and servicing, etc., uh, to have it in place in our group. We will be striving to make sure that this will probably be one major tender for three units. We'll see how it works time-wise. Since Dolna Odra is definitely exceeding that pro pro project, Rybnik, well, I'll have to make a proviso that it might happen like that, but it is our goal to have three uh, same class units. And offshore wind farms, I'll also tell you more, a couple of words about this. On the other hand, these are the elements which streamline our ability to lower the emissions in, in our group. On the other hand, we have decommissionings, and that's um, the uh, one of the units in Bauhatov, where we'll be decommissioning uh, one unit in Dolna Odbra uh, uh, two, uh, 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 and uh, since you know it's one and two, three, two, three and four have not been uh, up and running now until um, the end of the derogation. Units will be working until the end, and five and, uh, and uh, five and seven will be working until the bat investments and the Rybnik power plant. Uh, we will be decommissioning uh, two uh, units. Uh, an investment committee has just taken place, and uh, that's where we decided uh, on delivering heat. Uh, you know that we've uh, signed a four-page agreement between the municipality, ourselves, Termica, and the...
what do you call it? I forgot the name of uh, the uh, heat and power plant, cogeneration plant, uh, and those four institutions concluded an agreement and we will be delivering heat thermica uh, through its system. We'll be distributing the heat over the town of Rybnik. As regards the Apollo project today, we are at such a stage, I won't be reminding you all, uh, all, of all the uh, basic data on the capacity efficiency and, and emissions the uh, the dates are important that's June 15th and September 30th this year after the conclusion of an X or, or amendment number nine we, we we've just had a uh, meeting held a meeting with a, um, with uh, the consortium and they confirmed that these um, deadlines are realistic we also believe that they are realistic and they will be kept um, and observed uh, uh, how we working with the unit five shows well there have been already um, uh, periods where we achieved a capacity of 930 megawatts and that's where we're um, preparing for the 30 day uh, continuing work uh, period and once it happens we will be prepared to commission it uh, as regards uh, unit five and as regards unit six soon we will be uh, we will uh, be also processing that block and everything shows that galvanizing it and um, uh, and everything shows that uh, it will also be kept. As regards the Turov project, it is in line with the schedule. There are no problems uh, to commission it at the expected time of completion. Uh, the first um, uh, semester of 2020. Uh, the only change that might happen, and we're working on this, stems from the adjustment of the entire uh, compound to the bad breath conclusion. That's about the waste um, treatment uh, uh, plant. Uh, we want to have a single waste treatment plant for the entire uh, compound. This might lead to a certain uh, delay um, uh, from the conclusion and the necessity not only to adjust the uh, block. We Right now we're calling it number seven to the uh, bad conclusion, but also uh, to all the other, uh, the compound of all the other units work in, in Turov. The offshore wind farms is our new um, project, as you will remember from the strategy we showed to you in back in 2016, offshore wind farms were uh, among the very important elements of ours and we have been consistently working on them. Right now the process is underway. We've uh, uh, established PGE Baltica company and operationally we'll be transferring uh, the uh, employees from uh, Energia Odnawialna uh, Renew Energies to this and we want for Baltica to directly report to PGE board because this is a, a very crucial project and a very crucial project uh, process for us connected with this new a leg to be uh, created, uh, connected with uh, the Baltic offshore energy. As you uh, will see, we have three locations. First of all, it's going to be Baltica 3 and Baltica 2. Since this is a new project for us, actually for everyone in Poland, it is a new project. As you know, we've launched a tender on finding a partner, both financial partner and a technical partner. We, we've received uh, above a dozen um, uh, bids. This testifies to a large in, uh, interest in our a project globally. Right now those bids are being um, uh, verified and uh, we want to ch choose the bidder that we will be cooperating with. Next, at the first stage we want to work like this and then possibly work on the more remote location. Perhaps it's going to be a standalone work after uh, that learning period. Here we've presented to you a schedule when we want to conclude the first stage we've been talking about. As regards Dolna Odra um, uh, power plant, this 
is in consequence of the fact that in this location we have uh, we have uh, documents showing that in this location a CCGT a power plant that would back up uh, both the uh, uh, the wind farms, but first of all, um, not, not only offshore but but also onshore wind farms. Such blocks, uh, such units will be perfect to work in critical situations. Um, to use the uh, gas-fired units and as you will see here we want to actively use the new investment which is the Baltic pipe uh, to power those two units here we've shown you the deadlines right now uh, the projects are very much advanced with our partners who will be delivering gas natural gas for this power plant and if our talks are positive enough, then uh, these deadlines will be definitely observed. And right now we are working to make sure that um, these two units should be presented for the auction. To wrap up 2018 as regards the size of the events, investments, we spent almost 7 billion uh, in 2018 on all sorts of investments and here you have a whole array uh, percentage-wise and physically as well uh, in absolute figures how much we we spent on particular uh, items. Uh, I didn't mention this, so I'll, I want to tell you about the installation which was commissioned in uh, in 2018. That's the Waste to Energy uh, CHPP um, uh, plant in Rashov. Um, we are technologically prepared in terms of uh, of the buildings to launch a new line of 800, um, if need be, and we think it is needed because we're uh, we've been uh, obtaining positions from the the local parliament uh, and the board of the province uh, to launch a new line because those amounts of waste are large enough to be able to do it if we make this decision then other than the one which is the installation which is planned in war so it's going to be the largest waste to energy um, installation in Poland. I've, um, I said we, we spent 7 billion on all the projects and here you have the particular figures, which elements, how much we spent um, and this material testifies to the fact that we attach a lot of importance to growth, to development, and this was also shown on the previous slide, but because these are large investments, um, uh, 2 billion in conventional energies on uh, on maintenance, and uh, uh, all everything else is connected with the adjustment to BAT. Let me uh, remind you of our strategy back from 2016 when we said that we'd be trying to prepare all our assets for BAT uh, uh, after the decommissioning of the units in Dolna Odra and, uh, and Rybnik. Not everything will meet that case, but most of the assets will be prepared to be able to work with us in 2021. And the last slide is our information on the results of the uh, power auction uh, and uh, as the uh, power generation leader, we've also been leaders in this market and an active actor in it and the effects of the contracts obtained by us show that our team which was working very hard on this was able to develop such results uh, generate such results let me only discuss 2021 the first contracting year and here as you will know 15 year contracts relate of course to the new units uh, the units in Turov and Opole and that's the lower fragment of that graph all the remaining out of the 11,000 um, uh, plus megawatts are actually 652 megawatts, 11,652 uh, uh, stem from, from uh, our capacities that we 
we um, assume to have in the power market. I'm talking about the first ones because you will know that only the first auctions we can call them closed because the one-year auctions will be soon announced. That's all from me at the moment. If you have any further questions, I'll be happy to take them. And now over to Mr. Vojtovic. Please present the details of the financial uh, results. Thank you very much. Since it might still be interesting, let me step in at the moment. A couple of words about the energy market. As you know very well, GDP in Poland grew by over 5%, whereof only one-third translated into the growth of energy. That's roughly 1.7%. We used over 170 terawatt hours, whereas the consumption as such grew, uh, generation dropped. That stemmed uh, uh, from the surplus in imports. The surplus of imports was not stemmed from the from the higher import. It was rather um, because of the lower exports than in the previous year because of the price relationships among countries that interchange energy. That meant that export from Poland was lower than in the previous years. Uh, so coming back to the price, the average price in the base forward market with a delivery for 2019 for this year was 243 zlotys. As we can see on the slide, how it grew on a quarter to quarter basis following the growing CO2 emissions to reach 281 zlotys in Q4, and since then in Q1 this year we've been observing a slightly declining trend which we've been explaining both um, by uh, uh, the uh, higher uh, space which, tem uh, which um, uh, uh, translates into a lower uh, spot price and the lower demand. We can see a smaller activity from and customers in the market as regards um, the um, demand for 2020. Last year, the average price achieved by our conventional power generation was 176 zlotys. That was 11 zlotys more than in 2017. Passing on to the production volumes, we produced 9 terawatt hours of, ener of energy more, and this, is, this clearly stems from the assets acquired um, uh, and uh, about uh, about uh, half of this in Ribnik and the power plants, the pre, pro, uh, the legacy EDF, the assets acquired, all in all, produced about 10 terawatt hours. That's about 15, 16 percent of our entire generation. As regards, uh, aside from the volume, those assets added to us one important feature in the, uh, from the point of view of the power market, which was mentioned um, uh, by, uh, by uh, Mr. Vashiwek, uh, and it gave us a larger portfolio and a possibility of replacing some of those assets with others 
in the event of a downtown uh, or in, in emergency situations, coming back to the volumes of the appropriate fuels in uh, lignite, we have a stable uh, generation, hard, uh, longer uh, subovers. Uh, was uh, longer overhauls uh, were counterbalanced by increased load factors in Q4. We had a similar phenomenon, only the scale differed, whereas throughout the year the, uh, uh, the share of EDF of the new assets was much higher because in the base year 2017 only over one and a half months did we actually uh, have them as owners. That was less than a tenth of the year, whereas only half of, of a quarter uh, was added, to, so those um, increases were uh, 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 appropriately lower. As regards the financials, um, uh, EBITDA of um, uh, 6.7 billion compared to the 6.5 billion in the base year, reverse proportions are observed on reported EBITDA, so there is a decrease by 1.3 billion. One major, uh, one major item is that uh, in the base year, in 2017, there was the uh, ending settlement of uh, of the LTCs, which gave us all, all, almost uh, 1.2 billion zlotys in yield. The very assets acquired added to the recurring EBITDA over six. 100 million, and that's after including the fact that in 2017, throughout part of the year, there were already consolidated. Among the items which are worth mentioning or should be mentioned was a decrease in the results in the uh, trade uh, area because of, of the v price volatility uh, where the, uh, at which the trading company is buying in the market or in the group but still at market prices so this volatility impacted uh, the uh, trading uh, uh, the, the trading results and the other thing was the provision which we created in line with IAS 37 and that's for the amount of 261 million zlotys so these two effects are clearly clearly impacted the lower results of the supply segment. Even if we look at the recurring EBITDA and the increase of 3%, and before I was talking about the production volumes, the increase of the uh, production generation volumes were of 16%. Uh, These are slightly different amounts and the relationships also changed throughout the year. The EBITDA increase was higher after Q1, and then it dropped slightly from one quarter to another. So uh, this is an effect of a certain 
policy of CO2 cost recognition, uh, which I will tell you more about in just a moment. But, bef but before I reach that moment, let me mention the debt, the indebtedness that has actually not changed since the end of um, Q3, and it's still at the level of 9.6 billion, which gives us a debt to EBITDA uh, ratio of uh, at the level of 1.5, which as compared to other companies, both in Europe and in our country, it's quite a low ratio considering the fact that we are actually at the verge of or close to the uh, to, to, to the peak of our expenditure and it still allows us to evaluate PGE's uh, situation as very secure in financial terms. And now let me come to the pass to the uh, uh, less interesting, shall I say, topic about CO2 because Probably many of you, well, actually, perhaps not out of you, 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 you will uh, all have noticed probably that the CO2 costs um, from one quarter to another were not uniform. Conversely, to the revenues from um, energy, because these were actually two different principles or conventions of recognizing um, uh, power uh, generation revenues, where we we've been selling, oh, well, we uh, sold uh, contracts throughout last year at different prices but we recognized the revenues from one quarter to another at the same average price. It's as though you, well, if you made an average of uh, that blue curve and you applied the same price throughout the quarter. Of course, up to the energy that was uh, still sold on a spot or short forward basis, whereas CO2, for CO2 we applied a slightly different convention in Q1 that was an average FIFO. So we expensed those emission rates at, at such a price which were which had been bought the earliest. If that method had been applied later on, then throughout 2018, actually from quarter to quarter you could reflect the CO2 quotes from the prior year. That's to say from the year where, where we, when we bought those uh, CO2 emission rights. We, conversely, we applied a slightly, a slight modification of that method that was a method of uh, detailed identification, which, as we believe, better reflects the results of the trading activity. Because when a trader sells energy and trying to hedge the margin, they buy CO2 at the same time. So one could actually ascribe the appropriate CO2 to a particular sales contract, energy sales contract. So in buying the CO2, we ascribed it to a specific year. That's to say to the specific year of um, power supply and 
within, within that year, we still have FIFO. In 2019, we will make one more modification. In the same year, we will be using the average CO2 cost. So in our opinion, this will be very much aligned to the way we also recognize revenues from energy. So there we have a small graph simulating or comparing what, how the results would have changed on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis if we had applied FIFO as before. Those are the gray bars. And what would happen if we had applied the average CO2 quarterly uh, cost from one quarter to another? The volatility of the costs would have been much less. Of course, both methods in, uh, as applied in the same year, yield the same result. Passing on to several observations uh, on where uh, so splendid results came from, as mentioned uh, uh, by my colleague, which I'm confirming. Of course, our most important segment is still conventional energy, which in 2018 still encompassed cogeneration plants. And this segment is the most important one, and it also impacts the changeability of the results. As I was mentioning, before the prices achieved throughout the year, the price increases make the, the EBITDA increase by almost 800 million zlotys. Of course, the increase in the price since it was triggered by the CO2 price increase and the changes in the coal prices, it also had its result on the cost side. So 800 million in terms of the price as a plus, but uh, also the price uh, uh, for uh, coal was om almost 200, uh, over 200 million uh, higher and almost 400 million more in, in terms of CO2 emissions. So as you calculate the margin very quickly, we're talking about roughly 170 million. The increase in the wholesale prices unfortunately triggered a lower retail margin. That's the effect which uh, I've already discussed a bit. So here we can see 185 million zlotys. Uh, the other factors are probably less important or such, as we've always mentioned. So a higher increase. Uh, a higher return on distribution or an impact of this cost capitalization or other on uh, on uh, the result. This is something I've already mentioned uh, on operating results or other than their impact um, on generation from uh, lignite. That was a lower availability, but a uh, higher load. Uh, in hard coal, uh, both availability and uh, uh, and load was higher, 
CHP plants had a slightly uh, small utilization factor because the temperatures did not exactly favor so high a heat generation and, uh, and uh, um, by virtue of the same energy as well. Wind farms uh, availability at the same level as in the previous year, but owing to the uh, lower wind f windiness, uh, the uh, capacity factor was lower. In Q4 particularly, you can see that that factor dropped, but it dropped because in the previous year, uh, in uh, 2017, it was probably at a record-breaking level or close to the record-breaking level. Um, on distribution, here we've been ob obtaining better operating results. Let me remind you that the use, uh, the consumption throughout the system grew by 1.7%. In our area, including the one that our distribution has been servicing, that was 3%. So, uh, as usual, our area is growing more rapidly than the average for the entire country. Uh, network losses were roughly constant. We've been constantly reducing uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. Throughout the year, the network losses dropped by 11%. Also, Saidi and Saifi uh, dropped. Saidi um, fit under the required level by the RO, uh, ERO, whereas um, uh, so, so Saifi, sorry, whereas Saidi, despite the significant um, uh, drop, was uh, still b above the uh, level indicated by the regulator. In terms of the connection time, we had uh, several days of reduction or improvement. Uh, and this is probably uh, is what attracted us, more of, uh, most of us here. That's the slide on the outlook, how we perceive our results, uh, our prospects for 2019. First of all, this year, as of this year, we are separating one segment. District heating will be reported separately from conventional generation. Conventional generation will be encompassing the larger power plants with central disposition from Dolna Odra through Turov, Opol, Bohatov and Rybnik. Whereas the district heating segment will encompass all our uh, co-generation plants. In terms of conventional generation, we expect an increase in the results with the average price to be achieved uh, within the brackets of uh, 240 to 244 zlotys. In our plans, we have some overhauls in Belhatov, where energy is uh, generated with the largest margins, and we believe that those overhaul will decrease uh, our uh, generation by about two terawatt hours throughout the year. 
The increase uh, as a result of acquiring assets or exposure to hard coal was increased because of acquiring the power plant in Rybnik. And here we expect the energy price increase by about 20%, which already encompasses the uh, increase in the price of transporting hard coal from the mine to the power plant. For this year we've received fewer free um, CO2 emissions, which will also be uh, reflected in the financials, that's 9 million tons versus 12 million for 2018. Actually, a similar factor as uh, the increase in the coal prices and uh, CO2 prices also impact district heating. However, in a different way, this is a segment, uh, a tariff-based segment. On the other hand, the fuel price is not transferred to the tariff or the price so rapidly as in the um, uh, conventional generation um, uh, wholesale market, it rather takes place with a two-year delay. On the other hand, the benchmark nature of the tariffs uh, and the composition of the benchmark causes for uh, less than the entire CO2 cost being transferred to the tariff because and the benchmark will, roughly speaking, half of uh, uh, the heat uh, generation are not part of ETS and their CO2 uh, is, uh, is, uh, does not trigger any cost. So you can say that only half of the CO2 is transferred into the tariff. In renewables, that's a segment where whose results are very much dependent on the windiness. So, actually, the beginning of the year has been windy. We'll see what uh, the, next, uh, the rest of the year will look like. Let me come back to the split of uh, segments into convention and conventional generation and district heating uh, segments, because so far You've been seeing those uh, those segments all together, and the EBITDA amounted to almost three billion, two point nine. So you'll probably be interested in the split, how it would have split into those two particular segments. So roughly two billion, two point one would be the conventional generation in those larger power plants, whereas 800 million, uh, probably with a slight plus, was attributed to the uh, co-generation plants. Or district heating plants. Let me come back to the table. Uh, and the sequence shown in, the, uh, in there. I've mentioned the weaker results for the supply. We also expect weaker results in 2019. That's what we uh, uh, understand as the maintenance of the market trends that the, uh, that the supply company will have smaller turnover than in the previous years. We, however, we assume that we will expect a full compensation resulting from uh, the act of law that froze the electricity prices that we would uh, re, uh, obtain a full compensation. In terms of uh, distribution, we expect a decline in the results here. We expect that the act of law will be neutral, perhaps only the fact that uh, that uh, the issuance of uh, the tariffs is for distribution is being delayed. 
or postponed, perhaps we'll be uh, able to apply new rates only later. However, the fact that we expect a decrease uh, stems from the fact that the cost model that is a, allowed by the regulator does not allow us to transfer all our, all our costs and that's actually uh, it uh, and uh, now we're happy to uh, address any of your questions thank you very much for the presentation like i said first of all we will we'll, uh, give an opportunity to ask the questions from the floor we had an internal discussion about uh, about uh, my formulation, gentlemen, uh, we, because consistently the financial market has been uh, has been only send, sending gentlemen, even though in the power generation there is a diversity. Thirty percent of uh, of managerial uh, positions are occupied by ladies. However, here we only have gentlemen. Over to you, Pavel. Pavel Puchowski, can you hear me? Santander. Let me start with the EBITDA and the generation segment. A quarter ago, you presented the guidance for a stable generation all in all, which included a decrease in terms of heat. Does this still apply? Is it still valid this year? I can see those two, uh, two uh, separated uh, segments. There is an increase in uh, power gen and, uh, and a decrease in uh, district heating. But am I to understand that uh, both of those two results uh, should yield a stable result, as you guided three, uh, three weeks ago? And now, still, uh, that now that we're discussing conventional power generation, the question is how much uh, um, of EBITDA contribution is included in this year from the new units uh, in Apollo? Does it include any um, any um, EBITDA contribution from the new units in Apollo? The first question was whether the summing up of the increases in conventional generation and the decreases in district heating would yield a stable results for the sum of those sectors. The, the answer is yes. Good. So that was... <laughs> the answer was shorter than the question was. And the second one was on the impact of new units on EBITDA in Apollo. And again, uh, let me only make a brief introduction uh, on accounting. Before the unit is commissioned, whatever it produces, uh, the revenues, uh, whatever generation, uh, generates the revenues from that energy, adjust the capex. So what Unit 5 has been generating so far has been decreasing the capex, and you cannot see it until it's commissioned. It's not reflected in the PNL. Uh, so once the units are commissioned, uh, that's in the middle of this year, half through this year for for unit five and uh, and uh, in mid quarter for a unit six. Well, definitely there will be some impact in being conservative. We have not assumed a much higher margin to be obtained by us. We prefer to be nicely surprised rather than unnicely disappointed. Of course, I would rather knock on the wood if I had any wood here, because I believe that uh, the contractor will make it on time, but it's a matter of future and this is an unknown. Piotr, perhaps? 
Piotr Dzięciołowski, Citibank. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, um, good morning. Uh, I'd like to start with the EDF, um, uh, EDF assets. Which proportion uh, would you ascribe to the delay in ascribing the cost in the tariff system. So out of the 1 billion, you can see 100 on the PL, and which proportion would reappear then, and how large um, is the impairment? Because uh, you bought it with a different CO2 vision, and, and it's different now. I would start with this. It's a tricky question for me. Because the fact that CO2 has been growing and it's not transferred in the tariff, that means that those results are lower. So they are separated. Yes, but your coal cost has not been transferred. And how much did you lose because of a failure to, to transfer it into the tariff and for 2018-19? There is another price increase. How much uh, should you expect of increasing the, the uh, revenues and when? Or is it a lasting situation that it's not uh, generating 1.2 billion, that it's rather an expectation to be, uh, to be uh, half of this actually 600 million or so on a stable basis? Well, perhaps Jakub will share some more details about this uh, after the conference, but let me answer it in the following, following way. The same problem does not only apply to us. It applies to the entire uh, to the entire segment. Yes, but PG and IG is, is showing stable results on Termica. So where we have the exposure, well, yes, perhaps I haven't said that what I meant was rather um, hard coal-fired facilities. Uh, our facilities would probably still be able to uh, to stand such tariffs for some more time. However, the the facilities which are uh, um, uh, owned uh, by municipalities are probably in a slightly worse financial shape or situation. I would expect that through the activities of the sector, the tariffs will be made more realistic. Perhaps Piotr to address it. We purchased them at the moment when the assets for 2016 indeed performed 1.2 billion in revenues. That's what stemmed from due diligence. In 2018, it was 970 or 80. So that would be the base for the direct com uh, uh, from the direct um, comparison since the consolidation in mid-November, and this year it will be 822. To, um, uh, abstracting from LCTs. Uh, so the base is exactly as we expected and, and as we announced last year at the same table, table slightly below 15% of year-on-year -year, um, uh, decrease, which is in line with our expectations. And this stemmed from the fact of how our uh, coal um, contracts uh, look like and the t versus the tariff. Let me add that right now the talks are underway with the uh, uh, ERO uh, president to make the tariffs more realistic because we know that it's only covered there, the direct cost and, and distribution, not to only make it more flexible, but what happened with CO2 and coal prices makes, uh, uh, produces this significant delay and other than the flexibility also to make a split in the stemming from the fuel. That's exactly what I'm asking about. Are you assuming that in the perspective of two years, this business will be performing at 600 or 700 or a, or a billion. So, <clears throat> will you will you be testing it for um, impairment or not? 
Um, after the normalization of the situation in 2020, that's exactly my question. What is the expect your expectation vis-à-vis -vis this business? We'll be talking about 2020 in a year's time, so let's leave ourselves some time. I still have a, sl a slight uh, a question about this EBITDA bridge. There are a couple of items I cannot fully explain. You have a decrease um, year on year on wholesale um, supplies and other uh, items which uh, which yields a, a, an, a, an important uh, amount of, of uh, 400 million. What was it? Could you just say it? Is it a lasting change? Is it? What does it stem from? In uh, the previous years, indeed, we had much higher results on portfolio uh, optimization. I was about the purchases or higher uh, sales than expected and reversing the position within the year. As you can see, the strategy, strategy assumed for 2018, well, back in 2017, with a prospect for 2018, and what was doable for 2018, given the increasing CO2 prices, caused for those results not to be as good as uh, in the previous years. Here, the volatility was higher than we had assumed in our trading strategy, and we expect for this to be a one-off event, and we will be coming back to better trading results. Since it's the EBITDA bridge, EBITDA bridge uh, let me make it uh, more uh, in detail. What was the, 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 what was, uh, the uh, uh, contribution uh, from, tra uh, from uh, retail supply was uh, back from uh, three, uh, fr zero when we dropped to, uh, to, to minus or 300, was it when we dropped to zero? Perhaps it was something that we were not aware of or it suggests that the margins on um, on um, uh, supply to customers is much lower. Could you provide us with absolute, absolute figures what the results were uh, of the uh, supply contribution uh, in 2017 and uh, 18 and one other 140 uh, two million? How, what can it be ascribed to? Okay, as a result, the absolute figures for the wholesale result in 2018, it is still positive, and these are small hundreds of millions. Do we have any results on the others? In the remaining ones, that's mostly about overhauls and external services. Other 134. Since it's a dynamic PL slide, it shows the difference vis a vis the base from the previous years. And these are high hundreds of millions which grew by uh, significantly. I have some more questions, but let me, let me uh, allow my colleagues to ask those questions. Robert Maikuta, perhaps something more about district heating, uh, which will be dropping, I mean, EBITDA will be um, dropping. Does this estimation of a 30% drop, is it a fair estimate? Because we don't have the yellow certificates. I presume it's but about 10% of this will be uh, yellow certificates. We still have the gas contribution and the LC CT settlement, that's another 120 um, million for the um, loss, uh, 2018 loss. So on the operating business, how much would you expect for the EBITDA to drop in 2019? We don't provide figures, so I will not relate to the uh, amounts. 
but I believe that 30% is over pessimistic and that's significantly so. Let me come back to the LTCs. The nature of the LTCs in Jalonagura is such that this is largely about an adjustment of next year's uh, oh, uh, revenues. The amount of the, uh, the, uh, the revenues will be, will be growing, and the more the, the energy price grows, the more it will. It's an, but otherwise, it's a one-off. It's from today to, to 24th. That's the sum of the expectations. Yes, except that it lowered our uh, 2018 result and the question is if the energy price grows then it, it's going to be the adjustment will be revalued and if, if it's, uh, otherwise it's, it's going to be a one-off one more uh, accounting interesting thing the better future we expect the <clears throat> the higher the loss we have to recognize now, which in the entire LTC um, series is neutral, but, but we have to make a mark-to-market evaluation. Okay, the question about uh, the supply uh, segment, there was a provision in Q4, probably 270, 280 million. How should you perceive it in the context of uh, there being no regulation in place. I understand that you're selling at old prices, new prices. What can you expect in Q1? And the question also about distribution. Distribution was somehow taken away from the regime of the act and you, you're expecting a drop in the distribution which is slightly surprising. So given that there are no, no um, distribution tariffs, Will Q1, uh, can we expect a, a significant uh, drop in Q1 EBITDA because you're uh, applying the old tariff? Am I right in understanding this? On EBITDA, until the publication of the new tariffs, indeed we have to apply the old tariffs. That's from 10 to 20 million of difference a month. Am I right? Yes. And as regards uh, supply, the question was about the provision. Yes, the provision and what we can expect in Q1 and throughout the year is the 300 million that you expected uh, to be in the red and it, it would keep coming back along with the compensations or can this figure be higher? This amount was based on the act of law as of December 31st, which assumed various interpretations, the amended law made several things more precise, which would trigger the fact that the losses could even be higher. We, having based on the wording of the entire act of law, and that element which is contained in it, that's to say, the compensations, we believe that we will obtain the full compensations. It will probably not take place in Q1, which is about to finish in a couple of weeks now, and we're still waiting for the regulation to be published. So Q1 might indeed <coughs> It might not be so bad uh, in terms of the results, 
because the company still has several days from the publication of the regulation until the prices are changed. So, as of today, we're still thinking which revenues we should be recognizing in Q1. In Q1, we also have a situation that our auditor is also changing, so you have to consult that approach with them. As of today, we're applying those prices which either stem from the price lists as of June the 30th or from the contracts that the customers have at the end of the year. However, the fact is that we've also been obtaining various requests from customers to lower their prices even though there is still no uh, regulation in place. So to wrap it up, the fact that you, you expect the, uh, the drop of the revenues in, in the uh, in, uh, supply is irrespective of the, uh, of the re uh, regulation. The decrease that we, we are talking about today is a result of an increased volatility in last year and a lower margin that the supply has generated yes the last question from me because in re renewables you you expect a stable EBITDA if I remember correctly there was supposed to be an increase now my question is what, what does it stem from is it because of a new uh, I, uh, new idea of a new uh, new act of law capping uh, the, uh, the the level somehow uh, on the green certificates, is it connected with that, or what should you connect it with? Yes, indeed, those three months have brought maybe not some conclusions, but some directions which make our expectations change. Bartek Kubicki, Sofjem. Three questions, if I may. Two quite technical ones. Firstly, on the energy price you have for this year, it's very close to the average um, exchange price, whereas historically you've always generated some premium on on uh, on uh, the base load as compared to the exchange. Has anything changed in the mode of hedging? Can there be any upside to this price? Obviously, the price to be realized throughout the year will, will constitute a mix of the forward price in the prior year and the spot price quoted this year. For us, it's not the price as such that is so important for us, it's rather the price minus CO2. If our models should assume CO2 decreases, the same decrease in the price, then we would be roughly at the same level. So indeed we're looking at the spread rather than the very price. Besides what we what we can see in this part of the quarter that we have, the prices are the spot prices are lower than the ones that were assumed as forward prices in Q4. I believe that these brackets are rather good and they reflect our forecast of what we expect should the CO2 prices increase then also the sales price will be higher than we are estimating at the moment. Well, methodologically speaking, that's the average, um, uh, that, that's the weighted average of the concluded pr uh, contracts, uh, plus our openness to the price. So as 
As the CFO is saying, margin is king rather than the nominal price. Uh, okay, as for the coal prices, 20% is the unit price of coal uh, transport included, uh, the unit, unit price. Because b before you had 20, uh, 10 percent as 20, is this, that difference only about the transport, or is it anything that stems from the PGG contract? It's both a matter of the transport as well as the new contracts concluded. Okay, so the increase is significant, shall I say, and the last question about the power uh, market, because I understand there's going to be one more auction this year encompassing coal. So just to confirm, are the conditions going to be the same as before? Will you be able to contract your coal-based assets for five-year periods? Because most of your coal-based assets, the old ones, have been contracted for one year. So I should assume that this year for you, you'd be contracting most of them for five years. I'd like you to confirm whether it's going to be feasible, will the conditions change or not, as compared to the prices last year. All the contracts or the auctions for five years, we know perfectly what they are dependent on the one year and five year auctions, what the difference is. We expect that part of them, part of those contracts will be five-year contracts. Piotr? Thank you for giving me the opportunity of asking one more question. I remember that during our previous conversation, you were discussing that there might be some dividend policy in, uh, to be contemplating. I can see no mention of the dividend in the presentation. Has anything changed in this respect? Discussions are underway. We still have not developed a common opinion about this. Indeed, I mentioned that the, the annual results will be a good moment to say something about the dividend. The only thing I can say now is that the old policy has been maintained. I'd like to ask you what the business model is going to be of those new, new uh, gas-fired power plants, because I don't think anyone would be paying for flexibility, uh, for availability, yes, but the rough calculation shows that if you only were to take the current um, power price, then, uh, then such a unit would have a pay payback time of over 12 years or so, and would you be prepared to define it in this way? So. How is this project going to tie in, finan in financial terms? We, we can see the project in Stalovola, where there is a reluctance from the operators uh, to, uh, to um, commission that in, and show the result of the gas-fired power plant in Poland. Our analyses, so first Dolna Odra and then Rybnik, assume revenues both from the power generation uh, power market and energy market so here we have quite broad contacts with uh, the suppliers of uh, of those uh, of that equipment to perhaps show us some optimization possibilities both of costs as well as capex as of today i don't think we are expecting any special third uh, source of uh, remuneration for flexibility then don't the uh, don't, don't the cases of commenced uh, items um, uh, make you reluctant to start new items. We have the example of uh, uh, of uh, PK and Orlin. We have Stalova Vola, which is not operational, and uh, two uh, entities don't want to finish this. And actually, such units are off the market. There are only su such pickers, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, power mar margin will, will give you like 80 million of something that, that costs about uh, 1.5 billion. So what would be your minimum expectation and what are your expected levels? 
As the CFO said, we've we've been uh, involved in the negotiations, talks, and we even have this model to to carry out such investments along with our partners. Right now, the uh, opinion is rather predominant that we should be doing it on our on a standalone basis. And like I said, we will try to make sure that those three units would be announced at the same time and i expect some synergies here as well and indeed i confirm we are involved in talks with at least three partners for the capex resulting from this investment to be as low as possible but these are i don't know local local partners pfr because usually if you're saying that this is say a german utility and someone can see some private capital there then it's going to be very persuasive to other to other uh, um, entities at the at the stage of the con uh, the conversations right now we wouldn't be inform you about uh, any details we're talking about the diff different profile of the partner not about whoever puts money in this because if only they uh, decrease the capex because pg is is um, paying less and the total uh, price for the facility is the same except that we're involved in talks with suppliers for them to suggest that both through some of their involvement in the project they should be able to optimize it with regard to the capex and then the maintenance costs but we're also involved in talks about the uh, risk splitting we have some experience from apollo from turov and now we want to change the contract model and share that risk in a different way of course we're talking about a market which uh, will appear in several years time where there will soon be fewer coal-fired power plants. I mean, from the moment on when we've commissioned our gas units, and yet everyone will be interested in taking advantage of electricity. So the fact that there will be more renewables will only mean that, shall I call it, fluctuations in the uh, function uh, of conventional uh, power plants which will serve as a backup will be even higher i'd like to ask you about one more thing only because all in all uh, i've been dealing with pg of for almost 10 years and and i've always thought that your belhat of Anturo fleet would be earning more if the coal prices are higher and still we have uh, here a rebound from from 10 to 12 zlotties per gigajoule which which should translate transport included which should translate into the energy price also if from the economic point of view you should add free co2 then they should be beneficiaries perhaps not slight and not huge beneficiaries but beneficiaries of um, of co2 why can't you see it in the performance of those assets what's happening there if i compare the best result uh, the, the best example that was 2012 or the years, the previous years, where the company lost about two billion in EBITDA, we have energy prices back to the levels of of uh, 240, slightly some free CO2, and there is actually only one direction. And what you're saying that this heat plus coal and conventional generation is stable and flat. Could you say how much? Bauhatov would earn in 2017, 18, and whether it's going to be earning more in 2019, or is it going to be flat again? So Bauhatov has always been earning, and it is indeed a beneficiary of the coal price um, uh, or lignite price um, uh, changes. So if 
the price uh, of fuel is transformed into energy price, then Belhatov is earning more. In terms of CO2, is not it's not so straightforward because uh, its emission is higher than of an average. Uh, uh, unit in the system. Okay, so let's uh, let's assume that CO2 compensates. Let's make a, a basic calculation. Calculation. You assume 20 per, uh, percent uh, up in co price. That's um, uh, lignite should yield about 800 million of extra margin. That's a very uh, quick calculation. And now you are saying that in conventional air, uh, conventional generation plus heat will give you a, a stable margin. In the entire conventional generation, we might have about one uh, one billion in EBITDA. So how do these? Uh, how could these two uh, uh, you, um, entities not earn more on a year-on-year -year, uh, um, basis? Considering that you also have some uh, some um, free CO2, I can see several hundred million of extra margin, except that you have to pay attention to a certain train of events, because if we have certain energy prices today, they are derivative of the expectations of coal prices and uh, quotes throughout last year, whereas the coal prices and the increase by 20 percent, that's something that is taking place today. And today, the fact that PGE has uh, it, it, its coal is 20 percent more expensive, to put uh, it doesn't mean that the pr prices from the past will grow further. No, no, no. You, 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 you confuse me. So you've hedged the the coal and the energy prices, and and now they've gone up because if, well, uh, if it translates into 2019, well, you should have hedged them at the higher price. We don't hedge coal prices in the sense that when was that contract concluded? 2018. Yes, because. Uh, the previous contract with PGG ended or expired, and now for us the hard coal fleet, well, let me reach. Hard coal, hard coal prices is also important for lignite. Do you want to say you were you you were say, selling energy without knowing uh, what the coal pr price would be for next year? Because you you were selling at 240. Did you know what the coal price would be for 2019? Uh, as you as you sold that, uh, that that energy? Yes, we did, because we consolidated several. Um, contracts with PGE, PG, we consolidated it into one major contract, and and you, you, we definitely knew the price. So it is included in the in the co prices. So Belhatov should be earning 800 million more, as I as I believe. This is a major disproportion. We're um, we constitute a major part of the market, but we are not the entire market. We are rather. Uh, re a recipient of the price from the market rather than the creator of the price. So our cost structure does not always fully translate into the, the cost structure in the market. So the assumption that our coal prices are fully transformed into the um, prices in the wholesale market is, uh, that's quite a bold statement, because that definitely there is a time shift in this respect, because prices are not updated on a linear basis. We, had a, we have a, contact, a contract concluded in 2018, and whether in and the, the the last one on the stack to have the same contract that's the good question when they concluded when they build their expectations and those of buyers as well and additionally two terawatt hours of on lignite that's a very um, simple decrease in the margin because that's a fixed cost okay thank you very much one more thing about uh, um, coal and energy prices, because you, the year to date uh, on the wholesale market is about 200, uh, 240, 
And there are probably three uh, reasons. One of them is with a large windiness, a, 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 a very uh, warm winter, and, and probably also the, fr the act of law freezing the uh, electricity prices. And there's probably no one else to be interested in, in buying that electricity from power plants, because they don't know at what price they'd be selling it. If the regulation come, uh, appears, how much the energy price would would uh, would um, um, uh, grow by uh, only because you remove the bottleneck, freezing the price for 2019, or would you rather assume that 240? That's a fair assumption until the year of the year. That's a tricky question because no model includes a factor as an act of law freezing the prices and its effect on the demand side, um, on the recipients, final recipients. I fully agree that this factor does impact <coughs> the fact that the prices this year are what they are, i.e. rather low. So you cannot see much of a demand because supply companies don't buy unless they have someone to sell the um, energy to. I'm not capable or not prepared to say um, how much the prices will grow by once the regulation is published because that would indeed be a very rough assumption which would be um, laden with a big mistake. Um, coal prices for 2020, is it several percentage points or, or, or more? The contract I mentioned uh, that we consolidated with PGG includes prices for 2020. Of course, there is some ratio stemming from the inflation, but we know what the price is for uh, from PGG for 2020. So um, if we had at the ARA market a decrease by 20% on the coal market, it's not going to translate into your, it will, because we have uh, there's a formula uh, taking care of that, okay. including that. Okay, two more questions. One of them uh, from the uh, KC project. This is something which is, uh, we haven't heard much of, about this. What's the status of those negotiations? Will you be entering that project? And the, the, the next question is Lochev. Recently, one of the ministers was saying that Zlochev could be functioning along with the uh, nuclear power plant, and that's again the question about the nuclear power plant and Zlochev. Robert, I'm going to take your mic away from K uh, KC and Zlochev, perhaps. Okay, let me tell you about Ostrowenka. The parties are still at the table. The table can be broader or narrower, but they are still at the table. No, no, no. It's only about water. So there's only water on. Uh, and as regards Watchev, we have a program of Lignite development program. That's an official document which is functioning and we should be using it. That's the first item. And secondly, we have PEP 40, which has been consulted. Uh, there is still no ultimate version of the document in place. When it's there, we will be relating to this. And at this moment, we we are trying to obtain a concession plus two minor items have been commissioned connected with the transport. So we're uh, we're continuing the topic connected with the obtaining of the concession and the slot of development. But I'd like you to realize what Zwachev is, if possible, hypothetically, purely hypothetically, if we should assume that we would be launching Zlochev as only 18 million tons versus 40, which is represented by Belhatov today. So the problem connected with Zlochev is slightly different than 
uh, the financial terms. We are perceiving this that in 2035 uh, we'd be facing a major social problem. We have to prepare for this and prepare uh, major problems because even hypothetically this represents half of the uh, Belhadov output. In this context, the, the idea connected with the power plant, we've never declared anything like that. And also taking uh, into account what, what might appear in, in PP40 and which powers of the nuclear power plants will be stipulated there, it, it's going to be a challenge once this document starts functioning. And as part of, of e, EJ1, we, we've been doing this is something that it has been meant for since 2016, so we are uniquely uh, aiming at finishing, uh, completing the environmental impact tests um, uh, and, and, P, uh, and EJ1. Uh, one has no other, uh, uh, no other um, uh, 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 tasks uh, going forward, uh, especially construction. And whether we get involved in the development of nuclear energy in Poland will stem from two factors. What will appear at the end of the day in PEP40 and what we heard many times from the ministry about how the financial model is going to be constructed. Paweł? At last. Okay, now I have a couple of questions. Question one. You are providing um, energy prices, coal, 20% 20, uh, 20 that's hard, uh, easy to calculate. You can provide the average cost for 2020, that's the one thing. Secondly, you're saying that you want to sell 50% of your shares in Baltica 3. So what's the book value and how much would you would expect uh, as a one-off profit on the sales? And uh, thirdly, mention distribution is quite a negative surprise with you because given the uh, significantly uh, decreasing side sci connection times, it would seem that given the uh, average WACC, the distribution would have to increase or at, at, at the, in the worst case scenario, it would be uh, stable. Did you, uh, have you received any, any uh, adjustment factor, anything? Let me start with Baltica. We're not seeking the partner to earn on the sales of the company, of the entity. So, I would not relate to the book value or the profits or gains on a possible sale. We are only seeking the partner because of their competences rather than their money. As regards CO2, I haven't been able to find what I was looking for over those couple of seconds. Probably if we took the average price for the year, it would probably be close to the price we bought at. Of course, we bought slightly earlier when the contracting took place back in 2017 for 2019. We'll also be buying slightly in 2020 uh, for the generation to be for the production to be uh, to be sold on a spot basis but the first assumption would be well, an average price for the year which is quite a good estimator. What else was it? Plus the free ones. Oh, to relate to this, because in the presentation we, we were showing the average price, including the free emissions. So you also need to include those 9 million tons of uh, free CO2 uh, for a conventional generation and 1.9 versus 2.4 for district heating. And as regards distribution, 
przyjmujemy uwagę, że we accept that remark about the surprise, and we prefer to do it now rather than after. Well, uh, mid uh, half through the year, where, where it would certainly uh, be visible. Let me only repeat that the main reason is that we are not transmitting the entire costs in the tariff. It is one of the elements. The question uh, sounded because Gregors did not have the mic, whether it related to the increase in the remunerations. There are actually three or salaries. Uh, actually, there are four uh, factors. Uh, manpower, the uh, uh, energy, property tax, uh, and maintenance by external companies. And each of them, each of them contains some increases. Those actually increases the model that we that the regulator is using for determining the tariffs did not transfer all those increases. Which percentage of the costs would be transferred? I couldn't tell you just off my cuff at the moment. I've been getting more and more signals that we should be finishing for technical reasons. So thank you very much. Gentlemen, for coming. Also, for technical reasons, I've uh, been told that the questions to be uh, well that have been asked by the uh, web surfers. Uh, uh, well, I've reached them, but I won't be able to address them because they have not been recorded. So please resend those questions to me to my email because I cannot see the emails today, and then I will address them. Thank you very much for your participation and for the visit, vivid uh, um, discussion. May I invite you to continuing discussion informally and see you back in May as we, uh, um, as we publish the results for Q1. Thank you.